Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host Keith Perkelhammer. So today we've got Dr. Tim Hoban is back on the show. Hey Tim, what's going on? It's been a couple of months. Yeah, it's been a couple of months. Cross our fingers, all's good. How have you been? Pretty good, man. I, uh... I'm, 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 I got a different uh, audio mic set up here because mine kind of went on the fritz right before the show. So I, I don't know. We, you and I together might be kind of cursed in terms of technical uh, glitches. But um, it's hopefully... Two positives is too much. Huh? Yeah. So <laughs> hopefully everybody can hear me fine. If not, please uh, let me know in the chat. And um, hopefully the power won't go out in L.A. this time. Yes. Just <laughs> don't even mention it. <laughs> Knock on wood. So yep. uh, for those of you folks that don't know, uh, Tim, Tim is the president of Dr. Tim's Aquatics. For 17 years, Tim was the chief science officer of Aquaria Inc., the parent company, Marine Land Aquarium Products, Aquarium Systems, which is Instant Ocean and Perfecto um, Manufacturing. Tim's groundbreaking research on nitrifying bacteria led him to discovering and developing Biospira. Tim has authored numerous scientific papers and has written articles on tropical fish, for several magazines, he has been an invited speaker and contributing author at several domestic and international conferences. He was the editor of SeaScope magazine and is a member of many scientific organizations. I'm really psyched to have Tim back and hopefully for a nice uh, meaty chat here tonight. But before we, uh, we dig in again, I just want to thank the sponsors of the show, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate these companies supporting the show, and I appreciate you folks turning in. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. and. As always, I invite um, you folks to put your comments in the chat, ask questions. We have Tim here. It's, it's a rare opportunity to, uh, to talk to Tim here and, and, and get his uh, feedback on a whole bunch of things. One other piece of uh, housekeeping, um, Wrapping with Reef Bum episodes are now available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. All right, Tim. So in, in uh, trying to pick up what we left off, a couple of months ago in our conversation we were talking about bacteria and you know you were explaining that um, you know your, your company the products that uh, you guys sell are all natural products are not chemical based so during our uh, brief conversation you know when we were talking a couple months ago we we're talking about how you know when when 
people use these chemical-based products to address algae issues that they can impact the balance of a reef tank. You know, there could be some collateral damage. They, um, you know, these products can potentially kill beneficial bacteria, which is a, uh, which is an issue, you know, and I've, and I've seen that firsthand with myself in terms of um, treating a tank with a, uh, a certain um, chemical-based um, product to treat cyano, and, and uh, lo and behold, the uh, cyano goes away, but then I get uh, dyano, uh, uh, dinoflagellates. So it's, it's, it's not one thing, it's another. It's just, it's, and it's kind of a hard thing. I, I would think that in terms of when exactly a reef tank does go out of balance. Now, and I don't know how easy it is to quantify, but there's, there's, there's a service out there now. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Aquabiomics. It's a... Um, yeah, Aquabiomics. Yep. Yep. And yeah. it's a testing service that uh, would allow you to get more insight in terms of kind of that um, ratio of good guy versus bad guy bacteria, and you could find out a lot more in terms of uh, what, what types of data you can get from that type of service. But what are your thoughts on, on that um, you know, kind of thing in terms of being able to submit a water sample and get back some information that potentially you can act on based on the types of bacteria that you have in a, uh, in a reef tank? Well, I, I, look, I like it, but it's, it's very much in the infancy in that I mean, I've been researching the microbiology of aquariums for 30 plus years, and I couldn't tell you that if you have these 10 or 15 species, that your tank is going to be perfect. That, that's not known. And the only way to know that is through a service like this, if they can collect a lot of samples and at the same time get data. Does the aquarist submitting the sample, do they have dinos? Do they have cyano? Do they have a disease outbreak? You know, and start to correlate that. In a perfect world, you'd set up replicates and do lots of testing, but that's just not going to happen. The next best thing is to get a wide variety of samples and then start analyzing that for trends. Um, so that, But we're very much in the infancy, and then we have... Another big problem, say in a year or two, you can identify that tanks that are what everyone considers nice, you know, no dinos, no cyanos, no disease, no algae, fish are healthy, corals are rocking. They have these 15 species. We better hope we can grow them because it's very hard to grow bacteria. We can only uh, grow a very small percentage of the bacteria that we can identify in any type of environment. And so that's the next step is figuring out, do you grow them individually? Do you grow them as a group? Sometimes they need to be in a group because the, a bacteria takes a reactant and they make a product. So they take something, but they release something. Just like we have waste, bacteria have waste. And that waste can be a product or a food for another bacteria. Sometimes to grow two or three bacteria, you need all of them in the same culture so that their products and reactants feed each other. But we don't know that. So there's a lot of science, but you have to start somewhere. And it's good to see that someone's working on that. And um, we'll see how much data is shared and then data crunching. But that's really where that needs to go in the next step. Um, is is what's there and how does it react um and how does it react like if someone comes to me i was just at aqua shell people come up and they say i've got dinos and i can pretty much say okay your nitrate and phosphate are probably unmeasurable so you know they, they got to get that up now right. people want to debate that but it's just too common that with dinoflagellates, most people will say, not 100%, but way over 90% of the people will say, yeah, my phosphates are unmeasurable and my nitrates are super low. Now, there's a biological reason for that. Or they have cyano. Uh, I have phosphate, but I don't have any nitrate. And, and, what, and, I, and I can give a pretty good reason why you're going to get dinos with no phosphate, no nitrate, why you're going to get cyano with phosphate and no nitrate. If you have both in large amounts, you're going to get algae. Um, do I know the exact numbers? There's you know, not an exact number. There's a range there, but there's other factors too. 
And of course, the big factor is we eliminate all the bacteria from the, the water column. Right. You know, that's the, the one thing in the early stages of aquabionomics, they were doing water samples, but that's only part of the equation. What about what's living on the surfaces, the benthic or, you know, the benthic bacteria? And the nitrifiers are going to be on a surface, benthic, you know, attached to something. Nitrifiers, and they found this in their early samples, you don't find nitrifiers in the water column. <clears throat> so it's not an easy question. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I've, been, I've been in this hobby for a very, very long time. And, and bacteria has not really been something on my radar. You know, I've had a lot of success, but I've, I've never really, you know, thought too much about it other than when I'm starting up a tank, right, in terms of establishing right. my bacteria bed and having, a, you know, a good population of the nitrifying bacteria. But I've never, like, thought about good guy versus bad guy bacteria and doing a bacteria test and then potentially even dosing bacteria, which I'd like to get your thoughts on. I mean, you guys sell products in terms of um, bacteria um, products that you can dose to your tanks. But, um, you know, so, you know, I guess my question is, I had Mike Paletta on um, a couple of times and, and, and during one of those um, chats, Mike talked about, you know, having these uh, mysterious, uh, I don't know if they were RTN or STN events in his tank. And so what he um, ended up doing was getting a, uh, a test from aquabiomics to try to get a handle in terms of what kind of ratio of good guy versus bad guy bacteria he did have. Is, is that something that, um, you know, you think there's a causal, you know, a relationship in terms of a, an RTN or STN event in the tank and potentially being a, um, a result of having too much of the bad bacteria versus the good bacteria? I'm not sure about that because... Most of the studies that have been performed show that you've, you know, you're going to have a lot of Vibrio. Right. But, but it, the Vibrio, That's what other studies, about. yeah, the, the, usually the Vibrio is a secondary bacterial infection. It's just like with a fish disease. The fish gets sick, it gets a wound, or just like you get a wound or something, and the bacteria are opportunistic. And that's, I think, what's happening with the Vibrio and the RTN is that, yeah, you find a lot of Vibrio, so you say Vibrio caused it. Well, the Vibrio started growing on that tissue because it was wounded, but what wounded the tissue in the first place? Or the animal is stressed or something like that. So the, the jury's out. I mean, Vibrio definitely is a problem, but if you eliminated all the Vibrio, would you not get RTN? Even if you had a wounded animal, you know, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that. I would tend to think that there'd be something else out there right. that would take the Vibrio's place. Um, and when you start, you then start using antibiotics and you go, well, I'm going to, you know, the antibiotics, the problem with antibiotics is they're, they're uh, nonspecific. They're going to kill all the bacteria. Right. And that could just even stress things more and make things worse. Right, it, it, it is such a balance. I mean, I um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to personally swear off of uh, using chemical based, you know, solutions to uh, to to solve a problem in terms of cyan or something else in the tank. You know, I think, um, and and I and I also think that, you know, a lot of folks out there don't necessarily really, um, um, use enough elbow grease to fight these kind of issues. I think people are kind of looking for a quick. Um, shotgun approach to uh, to solving algae issues, but I, you know, detritus, for example, that's a big, big um, thing to tackle in the fight against uh, cyano or any other kind of algae. You've got detritus that's settling at the bottom of a tank, and uh, that's a that's a that's a basically a place where you're going to have a lot of nitrates and phosphates building up and accumulating and, and causing the issues. So, you know, one thing that I try to do when I do see cyano in one of my tanks is uh, take a powerhead and um, blow around the bottom or the rocks around the tank to try to get that to try to up into the water column or move it you know, via mechanical filtration. Exactly, because the cyano can kind of break down and feed on that detritus. Not a lot of bacteria, you know, well, some bacteria can, but like nitrifiers can't. But the cyano will almost always be where you'll have a lot of detritus. And some people will say, well, okay, I'll just eliminate the, the coral bed. I'll go bare bottom. Right. But that doesn't always work because then they just start, the cyanobacteria start growing on the live rock because there's lots of holes and places where the stuff ac accumulates. So definitely there's no good reason to have 
detritus and a buildup of organics in your system. Uh, in the ocean, that gets locked away. But we invariably will stir up the bottom. If, it's, if the detritus is b buried in the coral uh, substrate, invariably we're going to stir it up and that's going to make things even worse because then you'll get a bloom of nutrients and a bacterial bloom suck out the oxygen and things just go quickly downhill from there. I, I see a comment <clears throat> from Hammy's Reef and, and you know, a comment, it's, it's a comment you see a lot and the comment is I have cyano with unmeasurable phosphate and um, seven nitrates. So I think, and I think you talked about this during our last um, show that if you have you know, one versus the other, then you could have a, uh, a potential issue. I guess if you had, um, you know, zero nitrates and, and you had measurable phosphates, then, you know, that's one thing versus having um, the flip-flop. So it, it, it's, it's a real delicate balance in terms of trying to figure out a uh, solution to that sort of problem when you have, um, you know, either the nitrates or the phosphates at zero. Right. And, and, and you need, as you, as you talked about this earlier, quick fixes are just probably going to take you further down the rabbit hole. Yeah, you can use some type of an oxidizing agent or a, an antibiotic or a chemical, but that's just curing the or, or solving the, uh, uh, the symptom. You know, it, it's, not long, it's not a long-term cure. And invariably, you've got to get a little bit of nutrients up, and you really need to put bacteria in the system. Unintentionally, and we're talking about dosing bacteria, so unintentionally, the skimmer, the UV, you know, used, ozone used to be popular. I'm not sure how popular it is, is now. Um, but all these devices we use are eliminating bacteria from the water. And there's a competition going on between the bacteria in the water and bacteria or dinoflagellates or algae that live on surfaces. Because none of those devices, your skimmer, UV, all that, they do nothing to, it, to anything that's living in your tank on a substrate. They only kill stuff that's in the, the water. Right. And, in, you know, they, they're really good at removing the bacteria in the water, which is really what's keeping those nuisance organisms at bay. And what happens when you have zero nitrate or zero phosphate or both is you're not going to be able to grow the bacteria in the water. And so they're, they're not there. The, and the organisms like dinoflagellates are photosynthetic. And, and cyanobacteria can get nutrients from the detritus. They have ways of extracting nutrients from organics so that even though you say, well, how can I have cyano? I've got no phosphate. I've got no nitrate. Well, especially with phosphate, you're only measuring what's called the soluble reactive phosphate, the, or, the PO4-3 minus, that's uh, soluble reactive phosphate, which in most cases is only 1% to 2% of the total phosphate in the system. If you took a water sample or a, a sediment sample and you did a digestion and a total phosphate test, you would find that you have a lot of phosphate in the system, but the phosphate molecule is very sticky. It wants to stick to something. Right. And so you, your test kit can't measure most of the total phosphate in the system, but the organisms can get access to it, like the cyanos and the dinos. Let's say, you know, you've got zero phosphates or zero nitrates or you got zero of both, and um, you got a lot of cyano. So obviously the cyano could be one of the reasons why you're getting zero readings on your test kit because the cyano is, you know, absorbing all the nitrates and the phosphates. So, you know, one thing I also like to do whenever I do cyano is to siphon it out so there is not that um, source of, um, you know, the, a sponge in there that can, can kind of mislead exactly. you in yeah. terms of what you're getting in terms of nitrate and phosphate readings. What, what do you recommend besides siphoning out cyano um, at that point? Is, does it make sense to feed your fish more? Does it make sense to dose nitrates or phosphates if you're getting the zero readings, even if you're uh, siphoning out a lot of the uh, problematic algae and most of it seems to be gone? I mean, that seems to be an issue 
um, I run into every now and then. I'll see like a zero reading for nitrate or phosphate. Right now I'm dealing with um, you know, phosphates that are close to zero um, most of the time. But my corals are looking great. You know, I've got little patches of cyano here and there. Um, I've got some, you know, bryopsis that might pop up in, in another tank. But, um, you know, I'm still getting like zero phosphates. Should, should I still be dosing um, or feeding my fish more to try to get those phosphates up? Or is it, you know, in terms of the way the tank is looking and it looks good to me in terms of the corals, should I just leave well enough alone and just deal with the, uh, the zero readings? There, there's the key. If, if observe your tank, take some pictures. Everybody's got a phone with, you know, tons of storage space generally, but don't chase the number. Even when I say, you know, okay, you don't have any nitrates or phosphates. Are you seeing a problem? I agree with everything you just said. Siphon out the, the, the uh, cyano and get something in there to get all the detritus out. Are there dead spots? Are there places where it's accumulating? Get that out of there. If you still have zero phosphate and nitrate, but your tank is looking good, you're not growing any nuisance and your corals are healthy, I don't know that I would dose anything. It, your tank will tell you. You, you right. know, if you've been in this uh, long enough, you just know my corals, they're not colorful. They're not opening up. They're not feeding. But just to do something to do something, I, I never recommend that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in the numbers, you know, and, and what the test kits are showing you. And you just kind of get so focused in. I mean, years ago, I never even tested for phosphates. I, I test for nitrates, you know, alkalinity, um, magnesium on occasion. Uh, what else am I? Uh, calcium. And, you know, so, salinity and temperature, that was about it. I never measured phosphates. And my tanks always look really good. But um, I wasn't obsessed with it at the time. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of easy to kind of get wrapped up into what the test kits are showing you these days. You know, now we have the, uh, you know, alkalinity monitors and, and uh, you know, all this automated testing. And, and, you know, you could test five, six, seven times a day. And, and uh, you know, when is enough uh, information too much? Well, and I'll ask, how do you know the number's right? You buy all this electronic information, and it's measuring 24 hours a day, and these probes, have you calibrated them? Have you checked them? How often do you lot, check them? a lot them? of extra work these days. <laughs> yeah, there, there is, and, that, and I'm with you. I kind of could tell if, if the tank was starting to get patches of algae, okay, probably need to do a water change, or you know, a lot of people don't want to do water changes, but you know, look at, then you might do a test then. You, the tank tells you when things are starting to go south rather than just, oh, my phosphate's 0.05. I, the, the internet says it shouldn't be over 0.03, so I'm going to do all this stuff. Well, if your corals are healthy and your fish are healthy, why are you doing this? Yeah. You know, it's just to do it. it um, and people ask this all the time. You know, they just, what are my numbers? What do I want to be? What, where should they be? Well, what are you, what's your tank telling you? What, you know, yeah. what are your eyes and your corals and the animals telling you? Because yeah. every tank is just different. Yep, for sure. Yeah. All right, I yeah. want to get to some of the comments in the, uh, in the chat and some of the questions here. Now, um, we've been talking about bacteria. Now, you guys, and I saw this mentioned in the, uh, in the chat, you guys have a product called uh, EcoBalance, um, yep. which helps to block out unfriendly bacteria. Can, can this kind of product be both a preventative supplement as well as something to help shift the balance of bacteria to the good side? It can. It, it's not a curative. So, uh, cause it's, if you have a bacterial disease, um, you need to really intervene and knock that down. But it is a true probiotic and but probiotics are buzzwords. Everybody has probiotic. I mean, there's even probiotic cat literature in the industry. You know, there's some speakers out there that want to say that nitrifying bacteria are probiotics. And that's not true. You know, from as a microbiologist, there is a definition of what a probiotic is, and that is it has a direct positive relationship or, or, or effect. And so how does – there's two ways probiotics work. One is they bind to the binding sites, it, like the human ulcer. You know, for years, well, people have been getting ulcers for a long time. There was these two researchers that say, you know, ulcers are – caused by these bacteria binding to your intestine and causing that hole. And the, it, the universities and the medics were like, no, no, that's not true. Well, it turns out it was true because it was totally novel. But 
bacteria generally have to bind to a site. That vibrio has to get attached to that wound area and start multiplying to do the things that it, the damage that it does. If you can have a good bacteria, or at least a benign bacteria, bind to those binding sites, then the bad guys can't bind and they can't do their nasty deeds. So that's basically crowding the bacteria out. You just don't let them have any binding sites. The other way that probiotics work is that bacteria have warfare for space. Hmm. They emit substances to kill off other bacteria to take over their space, and that general category is called a bacteria sin. And if and that's what EcoBalance does. It does both of them, but th it produces, the bacteria there produce a bacteria sin to try to kill Vibrio in the saltwater and marine versions and keep them in low numbers or in zero numbers. So, you know, you dose that and it goes and it gets on surfaces and starts to grow and produce this bacteria sin, which targets certain bacteria. It doesn't target every bacteria because you don't want that. That would be like an antibiotic that targets everything. There's bacteria that are on surfaces like the nitrifier that you wouldn't want to kill off. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, you answered a question from Dave who was uh, asking how to get rid of um, Vibrio. And the, um, another um, viewer, Peter T., is asking, are there benefits of using the echo balance earlier in the, on in, the, in order to avoid dinos and cyano? I don't have anything to avoid the dino. The <laughs> dino is just <laughs> it, that phase. Everybody goes through it. Almost every tank goes through it. And I'm not going to tell you that I've got something. No, it, it doesn't seem to do anything for that dino. The cyanobacteria is more of a nutrient uh, imbalance or, or an, a real heavy organic buildup. Right. And you have a product called Waste Away that um, can help fight cyan, all right, in terms of, uh, it's a bacteria-based product. It's eight different species of bacteria that are isolated from aquariums. That's another key is all my bacteria were isolated by me from the, from aquariums, our aquariums. So they don't work in golf courses. They don't work in sewage treatment plants. You know, we can't sell them out in the ocean to get rid of oil. They really are made and, you know, isolated from and, and work in aquariums. Cause you talked about, you know, you didn't, people didn't think about microbiology because people just thought, well, a bacteria is a bacteria, you know, with the nitrifiers, it was nitrosomonas europea, it was nitrobacter winogratsky. They worked in cold water, warm water, fresh water, salt water, just, it was just those two bacteria. But when you think about it, why would it be the same one? These are different niches. They are totally different conditions. And it turns out that there's a wide variety of nitrifying organisms. There's these archaea that aren't even technically a bacteria that, that dominate in cold water systems. Below 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the ammonia oxidizing organisms are ammonia oxidizing archaea, not ammonia oxidizing bacteria. So, you know, there's differences there. Um, gotcha. Question from Reef Girl. The um, well, more of a comment, I guess. When it comes to bacteria products for dosing, she would love to see a label that identifies, I guess, the uh, certain types of bacteria that are in the uh, in the products. Is is that something that um, is um, difficult to do, or is that information that would be useful to hobbyists in terms of? So I, I guess what her point is is um, there's multiple bacteria-based products out there. So if you're using one. You know, can you use another because you're dosing the same kind of bacteria with one versus the other? You know, how um, how do you avoid duplicating bacteria if you're dosing multiple products? Well, I'm not sure. One, yes, we could name the names, but would you, would people know? Yeah. You know, it, and I, I would prob I would say vast majority of people wouldn't know one bacteria from another. So then do we start with a QR code and a big encyclopedia of what all these bacteria do and uh, makes it too complicated? We get that right now. You know, people are like, well, this is very complicated to do. It's bacteria and, and I'm not comfortable with it. I just want a quick fix. Um, to get to the second part, yes, you don't 
want to mix bacteria products on the same day. And even with our products, we say with the waste away, eco balance, clear up, start with a little bit because every tank is different. And if what do these bacteria do? They're going to, they want to grow and they want to consume nitrates, phosphates, and organics. Well, there's no standard amount that people have. If you, you your tank may have a lot of organics that you don't know about right. because they're hidden somewhere, but the bacteria are going to find them and that's what they're going to degrade because that's what they do. So you always start with a small amount. So if you're going to use multiple products from different manufacturers, I would only add one product at one time once a day. Why, don't why, don't mix. Why is that? I mean, are they going to just be fighting for uh, turf, so to speak, in terms of um, you know, do you, do you need to give the uh, the bacteria you know that twenty four hour period to kind of settle in to um, you know adhere to a surface? Whereas if you put in multiple you know types of bacteria, um, is there some sort of? I'm I've heard this before. I guess what I'm trying to understand is why you need to do that. It's got nothing to do with the bacteria stopping each other or one dominating another. It's more with just the numbers. All these bacteria additives, unless they're nitrifiers, are a group of what's called heterotrophic bacteria. Mm -hmm. They're bacillus, lactobacillus. And if you add too much at one time and you have a lot of nutrients, they will grow out of control. And that's what you're trying to prevent is just the uncontrolled growth of the bacteria or a bacteria bloom because mm. they will, one, consume all the oxygen in the tank. Ah, gotcha. And they can do this. These, these, these heterotrophic bacteria divide every 20 minutes. A nitrifier, in contrast, divides every 20 to 32 hours, depending if it's ammonia or nitride oxidizer. You, you can just do the math quickly. If you have one cell dividing in 20 minutes, in 24 hours, you've got trillions of cells and they're all consuming oxygen as they degrade all this, all these nutrients in your tank. So it's basically overdosing bacteria that can cause blooms that can cause your bacteria, your, your, your oxygen levels to right. drop. So what, what do you guys recommend in terms of your products? If you're dosing multiple bacteria products, do you um, say, you know, 24 hours in between dosing? for those two different products or do you suggest even all right we we say you know uh, right on the bottle do not add more than one bacterial product at a time start with a quarter or a half a dose if this is the first time you've used it and wait 24 to 48 hours and if there's any clouding to me how do you know so how do you Cloudy know there, you're getting the bloom your your water turns hazy you know, look down the length of the aquarium. It's been clear, and now it's getting a little hazy. That's a bacterial bloom. Don't add more bacteria. And, and I always preach small doses done frequently is much better than just dumping a bunch of bacteria in there and walking away from it or turning off the lights and going to bed. Never, never use them at night uh, when you when you can't. Be, uh, you got to do a little you, You'd be surprised. Yeah, you got to do a little babysitting. These are, you know, the, these products can get out of control. Uh, Reef with me, thank you very much for the super chat. The comment is love rapping. Well, we uh, love that you said that yeah. there. Tim, let's talk about um, dosing bacteria just on a, on a maintenance basis, you know, just to, on a regular basis dosing bacteria for a reef tank. And this is something that I've been experimenting with, you know, since the, uh, since the summertime. And, um, you know, you have a, um, product waste away, you've got waste away gels, right? So those are like time right. release type of gels. Is that a product that's kind of designed for a, um, it seems like that's more of a, a maintenance type of bacteria where you could continually dose it into the tank to, to kind of be a, have, have it act as a sludge buster. So you don't get that kind of accumulation on, on the sand and the sub substrate and the rocks is. Well, not only a sludge buster, but also to keep, keep the population of bacteria up in the water column to keep the nuisance bacteria that grow on substrates at bay. Because, I mean, I've been prophesizing for years, don't run your skimmer 24 hours and don't 
over skim. You, if you you sit at a, you know, I go to five, six, seven, eight of the shows, the Reefa Paloozas and the Raps and everything, and I ask people, you know, how's what's your tank? Or they'll show me, and they'll have a hundred gallon tank, and oh yeah, I got a five hundred gallon gallon skimmer. Everybody has a bigger skimmer than me. Yeah. Nobody goes, I got a hundred gallon yeah. tank, but I got a small skimmer. So they have the skimmer, they have the filter sock. Now they have the roller. That, yeah. It, and so, yeah, the ma- and all that is removing bacteria from the water, and that's just where people you're just going to get into problems eventually uh, with that. Or if you're too aggressive, add the UV and kill all the bacteria in the water. And so with the with gels, especially, fine. You you won't turn any of that stuff off. How do you get around that? Let's dose bacteria, and most people. You know, have some dosing systems, but the vast majority, and we, we, you know, we're for the the big, the middle of the bell curve of hobbyists. They don't maybe have all these devices and sumps, and they still want to have the benefit of dosing bacteria. That's what the gel is. It's simple. It's easy. It's 100% natural. The gel material, the card plastic cartridge is made from recycled plastic and can be recycled because the when we grow the bacteria. They actually come out as a powder. We grow them and then we freeze dry them because heterotrophs can form spores. Nitrifiers can't. We can mix the spores with the gel material and form the gel in the cartridge. And then when you put it in the tank, the uh, gel swells, releases the bacteria spore, the bacteria basically spore later or hatch, releasing into the water and start consuming nitrates and phosphates and degrading organics and doing what they do. So it's, it's a way to dose continually, which is really the best way to do any of this is to continually dose a little bit of bacteria and it makes it real simple to do. Is, is that your main product in terms of Continuously dosing bacteria, or would the uh, the eco eco balance also be something that you could use on a continual basis? Well, with the eco balance, we def we have a whole a recipe card where we tell people how to take the eco balance and take our mixture of vitamins, and you're actually gut loading the bacteria because what do corals in the real in the real world do? And even in your tank, they filter feed 24-7. They're filtering that water all the time. And in a reef, a natural reef, that water is full of bacteria. And, and if you're listening to this, yes, the common theme with me is bacteria. Yeah. I used to be a fish, fish guy, but then a zooplankton guy. Just kept on getting smaller and smaller. Guy. Now I'm a bacteria guy. Hmm. But, the, but the corals filter the water. The water's full of bacteria. That's what corals food is. Yes, they like the the copepods and stuff like that, but that's kind of like us eating french fries and ice cream. It's not a good, you know, all-around diet. What do, but what do we do? We use all these devices to eliminate bacteria from the water and then you wonder why your corals are losing color and not growing and aren't looking that healthy because they don't have the re- nutrition they need. Right. So with the eco balance, we have a recipe card where you add a small amount to a a liter of water, add some vitamins, which the bacteria grow on and incorporate, and then you dose that into the system. And uh, people that have done this, you know, three weeks later, their corals are just so much more colorful because they're getting the the nutrition they need. And it keeps the nitrates and phosphates down and the organics down too. So you mentioned UV. Uh, Is it okay to run UV 24-7 on a reef tank? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, especially if you're dosing bacteria on a continual basis like with the uh, waste away gels. Would uh, would you recommend not running UV if you're using that product? I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of UV unless you really have a crowded fish only tank, a history of diseases. Uh, and there's a reason you have a history because you probably have biofilms and the biofilm is a reservoir, you know, that, that slime that's somewhere in the system. And you think, well, I clean my tank. Uh, th- this is a big problem with zebra fish. Now, zebra fish, you know, the common Danio is a huge research animal. And there are these National Institute of Health and universities where they keep different lines of these and literally have miles of pipe. Whereas they're because all the tanks are like one gallon each, and they have thousands of these tanks, and they want them to be disease free, and they quote cure the disease, and a, you know a week later it's back because the biofilm on the inside of the pipes 
is a reservoir that's harboring these disease organisms. The same thing in your fish tank. You've got a lot of organics because you're feeding a lot. That grows biofilm that's in the pipes and in the system where back nasty bacteria live, and they are the disease-causing organisms. So um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of UV in most cases because, again, it's eliminating all the bacteria. And I'm more going for targets. Well, is, isn't it true that um, you know most of the bacteria is already adhered to surfaces like the substrate and the rock and, and that sort of thing? Or um, I guess when you're dosing bacteria, you've got some free-floating bacteria. But what, what types of bacteria, I guess, should we be concerned about being zapped by a UV? Well, the, the, the bacillus, the waterborne bacteria that are going to be consuming the nitrates and phosphates. And you, say, you talk about on the surfaces. Well, bacteria and bacterial biomass are food for other organisms. That's why if you take a, a piece of detritus and look it under a scope, there's all sorts of worms and all sorts of you know, other things in there that are eating that detritus because there's bacteria attached to those detritus. Everything's food for something else. And when that d detritus gets too much, when it gets overgrown and starts going anaerobic or anoxic, then you start growing the nasty. Most of the nasty bacteria tend to grow in that type of low oxygen environment. That's why you want to keep uh, those down. Vibrio, they want to attach to something. You know, they, they want to attach to that coral tissue. They're not generally in the water column. Um, and I think if you looked at what was being killed with with a UV, in most cases, for most people, it's going to be beneficial bacteria that you'd rather have rather than eliminating bacteria numbers from the water column. Uh, we have a question here from Ghouls, and we've got some other questions too, uh, Tim. That we'll uh, we'll get to. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to stay on topic. I don't want to like jump all over the place here. But um, question is: Is Eco Balance similar to Vibrant? I don't. I don't know what what's in Vibrant. Uh, um, I didn't. Have I would good, doubt I it. I didn't have a good experience with Vibrant. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Vibrant, but I'm. I'm I hear one, either I'm people person. like it. Yeah. I, well, I hear people either like it or they really don't like it. There's kind of no middle ground with it, and uh, you know, it doesn't really say w what it is. And so I. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I hear you. Um, okay. So waste away is like a sludge busting bacteria and it can help with cyano. Can it also help with um, green problematic algaes like hair algae and bryopsis? Well, it can indirectly because again, it's the idea is to build up bacteria in the water to consume the nutrients and get rid of the organics that the bryopsis and the green bacteria work. And that's why none of this works overnight. You know, people do want that fix and we're not the company that's going to say, yeah, fix it overnight. Yeah. It took a while to get the problem. It's going to take a while to get rid of it. It just takes some patience and a, and a different mindset. You just have to change what you're doing. Whatever you were doing, if it led to a problem, maybe, you know, the, the definition of insanity is keep on doing the same thing. <laughs> maybe change what you're doing. <laughs> what about... Um using Cato when you're dosing bacteria. You know, when I, when I started dosing uh, bacteria back in the summertime, you know, a uh, month or two later, my Cato crashed on both uh, systems. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that something that's, you've seen uh, with, with your products too? Yeah, because it's basically two ways to do the same thing. The Cato is incorporating the nutrients to keep it out of the, uh, you know, away, away from nuisance organisms. Um, and that's what the bacteria are doing. Now with the Cato, what you've got to do is you've got to harvest that. It's incorporated it in there, but if it, if the nutrients go too low, the Cato will crash and then everything, you know, it, it, all crap breaks loose. That's why you have to go in there and take scissors and, and remove it, keep it moving. Where with the bacteria, what you're basically doing is using the skimmer as a tool. We know the skimmer is removing bacteria, so we're dosing bacteria and trying to get ahead of the skimmer and, and dose enough bacteria with the gels that even with the skimmers removing, the bacteria still have time because they work so fast to get rid of the nutrients and keep it under control. Yeah, you know, it's interesting what you said in terms of the, having too big of a skimmer on the, on the system. I had a, um, 
my system when I started it up about uh, six, seven years ago, five, six years ago, I had a uh, an oversized skimmer. It was the skimmer was um, uh, I got a bad recommendation on the skimmer, and it was very inconsistent in terms of the skimmer. It was like you know skimming at, at certain points of time and then would stop skimming and and uh, you know so it wasn't good. So I had to actually get rid of that skimmer and get a much smaller uh, skimmer, which I'm I had I had no um, you know real knowledge at the time in terms of about the bacteria and, and it's interesting it makes a lot of sense that you're skimming out uh, beneficial bacteria with a uh, with an oversized skimmer what um what do you what, go ahead well what's interesting in anybody who's really interested in this sanjay published a paper it's been 10 13 years ago it's a really nice paper that he and dr johnson published um, with a flow cytometer. So they're looking at numbers of bacteria in the water, and then they turn the skimmer on, and the numbers plummet. And they actually found that the number of bacteria per mil in a tank with a skimmer was less than what you found in natural reefs. They compared it. What was also interesting is they found that the skimmer was removing certain groups of bacteria over other groups of bacteria. Now, this was before aquabionomics, and, and you could be able to do that. So that's one of those things that would be super interesting is to go back and repeat his study, but now grab samples and do some aquabionomics, you know, some bionomic studies to see what's, le what's left over. And then you start to see that in, in your aquarium in, in surfaces and things like that. Yeah, you know, because I guess my question that I that I had is, um, you know, you talk about turning off the skimmer. You know, how um, what what what's an appropriate amount of time to turn the skimmer off? I guess it just kind of depends on the uh, on the tank, really. It it does. I usually recommend two hours at night. Every night. You know, don't dose it. every night. Yep. And uh, there are people that come up after you know you know I'll be back at another show a year later, or they'll come to you know people usually go to more of one show and they'll come back six months later and they'll say that was the best information I ever got was to turn that skimmer off, and it's free. It's not like I'm you know, it's put it on a timer, put it on your Neptune system. Just think about what's happening in nature, and yes, we're talking bacteria, but it really the bacteria control the system. And this is and they really and, do. And, and you would recommend doing that even if you're not dosing bacteria. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. But if you're dosing yeah. bacteria, yeah. how how uh, how often how how you know long would you suggest turning the skimmer off per day? Well, like like I said, dose bacteria during the day, so it's a long time, twelve hours or so before you turn that skimmer off. Okay, you guys yeah. recommend twelve Do hours. Yeah. Yeah. Some well, what are bacteria now? When when you, you have a problem, we have a recipe card for dealing with cyano or dino. Gotcha. Well, what we do say is, add the the waste away, turn the skimmer off for one or two hours because you're you're in this numbers game. You want that waste away bacteria to go attack the cyano and the organics, and and start multiplying and build up. But if you start seeing cloudy water. Well, you know the bacteria are working. Now you want to get rid of them. You don't want them to bloom so much that they have a negative effect to the tank. So you got to turn the skimmer on. So you go back and forth. Dose, no skimmer, turn the skimmer on. The next day, turn the skimmer off, dose a little bit. And you're just letting the bacteria build up and then removing them. And it, it takes time. It takes several days to a week of doing that to start making an, making an effect. Best time of day to turn the skimmer off overnight? At night. Yeah. Definitely at yeah. night. Why? Because the corals are feeding at night. Yeah. And your bacteria are multiplying. So maybe what will happen is the coral, definitely the corals will be eating. And so you, the skimmer is fine because your, your corals are going to be uh, ingesting and filtering out those bacteria that are growing. And so you get two for one. Removal of nutrients and better looking corals. That's a nice one-two punch. Um, yeah. So, all right, we got um, Reef with me was the person that was asking you uh, the question about the purple uh, non-sulfur bacteria, and then and then all of a sudden the power uh, went out on your end. So, I, this person is uh, is asking, um, uh, let's see, is it possible to seed purple non-sulfur uh, bacteria in in a system? You know, bacteria in general. Is, so, I guess you know, in terms of seeding that type of bacteria, is that possible? Well, I'm not sure what you can add it. Is it going to stay 
Probably not. Uh, don't really see much evidence of PNS, purple non-sulfur bacteria, actually living in the aquarium environment. Um, so it's a temporary thing. Um, you know, there, there's adding the bacteria, but then there's also, is it going to stay and, and grow and become established? And I'm not sure in any of the aquabionomic studies I've shown that those bacteria are actually in an aquarium. And we generally can't force an, a bacteria into the system. Just Even if we add it, uh, doesn't mean that it's going to become established. I'm just look, looking through more of the, uh, the chat here. Um, somebody is commenting, I don't want to have to dose anything. Makes no sense to me long term. Water changes, that's it. Maybe caulk or two part uh, caulk and a calcium reactor. And, you know, to keep, a, keep it simple uh, approach, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it all depends on, you know, if, if you don't want to dose any bacteria or things like that. I would say you need to keep your organics low, which means you don't, you can't have a lot of fish. I mean, those types of systems work where the coral, the system is dominated by coral and you have very few fish and you don't have to make lots of additions. But what's the key there? Very few fish means that you're not feeding much. Right. And, and that means you're limiting the amount of organics in the system. So if that's what you want to do, you can definitely do it, but you're not going to be able to do it with a bunch of fish in the system right. where you're adding a lot of food. Right. It's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Uh, what about carbon dosing? <clears throat> you know, uh, dosing like vodka or something with, with your products is 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 that um, is that really a risky proposition? And and uh, I mean, I've always been scared of doing that personally. But, uh, well, it is. It, you know, no pox and vinegars and and those fuels. The assumption is that the system is low in carbon, not bacteria, because bacteria need nitrate, phosphate, and carbon. And if one of those is eliminated, you're not going to be able to grow bacteria in the water column. We're talking about pelagic bacteria in the water column. And if you're adding carbon, that assumes that there's not a back, enough bacteria in the water. Right. But the problem with adding like waste away and a fuel at the same time is you're going to probably get a bacterial bloom. Right. Because it's kind of like adding lighter fluid to an already lit barbecue. You're just striking a match and uh, the forest is going crazy because these bacteria grow, as I said, very fast. And now you're overdosing nutrients and they're going to grow to that level of nutrient. And they don't stop growing. You're just because they run out of oxygen, they just shift. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Most heterotrophic bacteria can grow aerobically with oxygen in the water. They can grow anaerobically, a little oxygen in the water, and they can grow anoxically, meaning no oxygen in the water. Now, what they, the, the reactant that they use and the product they produce are completely different, but it's the same exact cell that's doing that. You know, it's, um, it's interesting. You know, we had a, uh, there, there's a question, um, Clyde, uh, is asking, do the bacteria have life cycles? Do they die after a certain amount of time? <laughs> that's, a, that's an existential question. Yeah, that's a profound question, right? It, 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 and, I mean, it is because a bacteria lives to divide. Once w one bacteria divides, who's the mother, who's the daughter? They're two independent cells that are going to further divide. So... Generally, with uh, a bacteria cell, e even death, they can go, you know, if they don't have nutrient. People say, well, I didn't feed the bacteria or, or I need. They say this with nitrifiers all the time. I have to add the ammonia three times a day or they're going to starve. Bacteria operate physiologically and on time scales that we just can't comprehend. They, they do not need to be fed every day. They don't. You know, nitrifiers, how can they live in a bottle? Well, they don't have oxygen. They don't have lungs. 
They only need oxygen when they're oxidizing the ammonia to nitrite or nitrite to nitrate. Don't give them ammonia. They don't need oxygen. They don't need it to survive. They need it to divide. So there's a, a lot of bad microbiology, a lot of you know, just stuff that doesn't make any sense from a micro, microbiological point out there. Unfortunately, they become uh, solidified. You know, that's the knowledge. And it's like, no, nah, that's not what happens at all. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because there just seems to be so many gray areas, you know, and, that, and that's what scares me about um, carbon dosing is like, how do you know when, when too much is, you know, too much um, before it's too late? And, um, exactly. And, and um, I don't want to crash a tank well, doing that. Yeah. Well, plus people will say, you know, I had cyanobacteria, so I started carbon dosing. What? And I'll say, and the cyano got worse. Yes. Why? Because there's tons of cyano. They want that carbon too. They just said, thank you very much. So you're not growing the competition because the competition, the number of good bacteria is so less, you know, so f much less than the cyano. All you did was grow more cyano. So. What um, carbon dosing is is Russian roulette to a certain extent? Yeah, I feel it's not. It's I, I don't I, you know I don't have the uh, the hard for it to to uh, roll those dice. It's uh, yeah. I you know it's um, I, listen. I I know folks out there have had success with it, but uh, it's not for me. All right, moving on. What um, what do you think about a tank with a bare bottom versus a sand bed? Do you think um, you're missing a lot in terms of being able to, you know, house beneficial bacteria in a sand bed. If you go with a bare bottom tank, you don't have that. Um, do you need to have more live rock in a, um, you know, in a bare bottom tank? Do you need, um, you know, um, some more uh, biomedia in the sump? Do you do you need to compensate for that lack of a sand bed someplace else? Well, the the answer, in in my opinion, is it depends on the age of your aquarium. If you're trying to set up and cycle an aquarium in a reasonable amount of time, if you don't have substrate in your aquarium, it's bare bottom, it's just going to take much longer. I mean, people do this all the time. They'll buy our nitrifiers. We'd say bare bottom tanks take longer. And that's because the nitrifying bacteria need to stick to something. And most people... You know, they don't have a sump and they don't have bio balls. Bio balls are kind of, you know, old school. Yep. And maybe they'll have the, uh, you know, the, the ceramic medias and things like that. But think about it. If you just put a piece of ceramic media in your sump laying flat, well, the water's not going to go over it or even through it. It's going to go over it. You've got to put a wall of ceramic media up to make sure the water goes through it. And so the bacteria aren't going to live there. You know, people want to talk about surface area, surface area, surface area. Bacteria don't grow to the available surface area. Bacteria grow to the available nutrients that are in the water. You, you can't grow nitrifiers to take care of two pounds of food if you're only feeding an ounce of food. If, does that make sense? Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they, they, you just don't have the ammonia to feed them. And so cycling a tank, you definitely, if people want bare bottom, I say put a layer of media, one layer of media, layer of marbles, our biomedia, because once the tank ages, then <clears throat> things change. And I actually did a study and presented this at, at a MACNA several years ago, and this is what comes into live rock because people want to think that live rock does denitrification because as tanks age and they get settled in, you don't see a lot of nitrate. And it was like, well, that's nitrification on the outside and denitrification on the inside. Well, we did a study where we were cutting this live rock into, you know, it's right down the middle in half and extracting the DNA and some other things. And what it turned out is there's no de denitrifying bacteria in there. What you have in older tanks with that are balanced is you have ammonia being assimilated by organisms that are living on the live rock, meaning ammonia is directly taken up by the benthic algaes and other organisms. It's not going through a bacterial process. That's why you don't get the nitrate because it's actually not being nitrified. So – 
you guys have a product called um, One and Only Live Nitrifying Bacteria. Is that is that a product that you could use in that sort of um, you know situation if you're going bare bottom if you're you're starting a tank with the dry rock only. Is is that um, something that kind of helps seed the tank and get it going? Yeah, it's 100% nitrifiers, and that's exactly what it's for. But you have to realize they want to be on a surface. So you've got to have lots of water flow and get rid of the filter sock and the UV and the skimmer because you want to keep those nit nitrifiers in the system and get them to attach to something because they really don't start working until they become attached to something. Yep. Right. And so you, you guys have um, uh, biomedia, right? So if, if, if you need to um, you know, find the additional services, you could use that biomedia. Right. And you can put a thin layer on the bottom of the tank, let the tank cycle, age it a little bit, and then siphon the media out. You know, and just realize, though, because people, you know, the knock has always been, well, if you have a, quote, biofilter, you're going to grow nitrates. Well, if you have a lot of ammonia, it's you're going to nitrify one way or another. I mean, it's just going to happen unless... You know, if you, if you say, well, you just said you can do it with live rock. Well, that's a balance. And that means you don't have a lot of fish in there because with a lot of fish, you're generating a lot of organics. And that changes the entire equation. Gotcha. So. All right, folks. Um, we're about uh, we're about an hour into this uh, live stream. Tim, can you hang in there for uh, for a little bit longer? Yeah, that's cool. I'm doing fine. Right, I'm enjoying cool. this. All right. So, folks, uh, ask uh, more questions. I'll do my best to uh, to pick up all the comments. I know we have a lot of comments in the in the chat, but um, more questions would be uh, awesome. What about um, the use of activated uh, carbon, Tim? Is is that something that you um, you know recommend for a tank? I do recommend activated carbon. I mean, disclosure, we do sell it, but I think that in most cases you've got this class of organics, the dissolved organics. And if you think about, again, go back to a natural reef system, the water is generally very clear. It's colorless. Right. And that's because there isn't a lot of dissolved organics in the system that makes the water yellow and tinges it. And that's what activated carbon can remove. So I'm definitely a believer in quality activated carbon. We um, have a couple of questions about um, eco balance again, and one question is: Vibrio causing STN? Anything other than eco balance to help the fight? You know, uh, there was just an article in uh, a little blurb in Coral Magazine about these researchers that came up with a treatment for that to kill the Vibrio, and but you have to be a licensed. Um, they're they're not releasing it out to a public. Um, there's different types of things you could do a topical, you know, apply some antibiotics in a, in a, in a gel. Cause once the Vibrio takes off, it's, it's, again, it's a numbers game and you really need to get aggressive in that. If you can, I would, I would remove the coral from the tank and put it in some type of hospital tank. Never like to treat the bulk tank. Um, it's just hard to do. Uh, Using probiotics, they're not really medication because they're just not a number enough. They're just not going to be able to grow fast enough. The Vibrio is always going to win out on that. So you've got to you've got to intervene with some type of an antibiotic to really, unfortunately. Gotcha. Um, what else we got going on here in the chat? Uh, comments about there's a thousand different ways to keep a reef tank. That is for sure. There, that is for sure. Because I saw someone was talking about don't keep fish. What I was saying is, it, it depends on how much interaction you want. If you don't want to dose stuff, if you don't want to intervene a lot, if you want more of a a natural and natural means that you are as hand much hands off as you can, then my thesis is that you need to limit the number of fish because you need to limit the amount of food that you're putting in the system. And that's based on experience. You know, we've got a lot of reef tanks. We've had a lot of reef tanks, and uh, you know, you can keep you can keep reef tank in a small five ten gallon system, but you're just keeping corals and maybe one or two very small fish. It's all inputs. It's balancing inputs. Yep. And inputs food is the major input. Yep, for sure. So, so yeah. uh, Keith Bratley is wondering, what are Dr. Tim's thoughts on biomedia? Does it work? Is more better, and should it be replaced? 
Uh, well, I'll start from the back. Replaced? No. Cleaned? Yes. And that is because most biomedia, as people use it, becomes clogged with organics. So think what's happening. The biomedia, the purpose is to grow nitrifiers. Nitrification happens in a 10 micron zone. There's papers that, that show this. I have a slide from a really cool paper that was done, published in Applied Microbiology, where these researchers took ammonia probes, nitrite probes, oxygen probes, and they could move the probe at 10 micron increments. That's the width of your hair. <laughs> and what they showed in the biofilm, because the nitrifiers are on a, you know, in a biofilm, nitrification took place in a 100 micron zone. Now, you bury that with organics. What's going to happen? The water's not going to go through there, or the, the heterotrophs that are degrading the organics are going to consume the oxygen, so the water's going to go where the nitrifiers were, and it's going to have no oxygen in it, and they need oxygen to do the work. Whatever your biomedia is needs to be kept clean. And nitrifiers are real resilient. So taking out your biomedia, your whatever it is, and shaking it in some seawater. One person, uh, we had an email, should I clean it in RO water, <laughs> RODI water? No. RODI water is a good way to kill all your bacteria. <laughs> all we're trying to do is clean the organics. And nitrifiers love to stick to something, so a, a no, I'm not saying go out there with a, you know, sprayer, yeah. you know, and but just wash it and get that organic material out and put it back does wonders. Um, I I like biomedia because that's where, you know, but you got to have water going through it. Just throwing it in a bag and putting it in a corner is it, it's not doing anything except taking up space. You got to have the water going through it. Think about the nitrifiers, what they need. They need fresh water and they, you know, fresh seawater and, and they need to not be buried in organics. All right. We have a few more um, questions that are popping into the chat here, but I got a question for you that just kind of uh, popped into my head and it's, um, I don't know if it's related to what we're talking about with bacteria or not, but this is about um, frag tank. And, um, you know, I've been keeping frag tanks for a long time and Primarily, I've been using egg crate, you know, acrylic, uh, not acrylic, but um, plastic egg crate. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's always a challenge to try to keep the algae from the um, adhering to the egg crate. And, you know, Great. what I've always heard is that phosphates can be leading, uh, leaching out of that uh, plastic egg crate, which can, um, you know, cause the, uh, the algae to form. But is there also, and, 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 and I, I totally buy into that, I understand that. Um, but there's also egg crate that you can buy from online retailers that apparently don't leach out phosphate, and I've had issues with algae growing on that, that egg crate as well. But um, what 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 can we do to prevent you know algae from adhering to new surfaces? Do you need to um, you know is that just going to happen no matter what because you don't have any bacteria that have colonized those new surfaces? So when you stick on a piece of egg crate, even if it's not leaching phosphates. Um, the fact that that egg crate has absolutely nothing on it, is that an attractant for, uh, you know, hair algae or whatever because it doesn't have a coating of bacteria on it? And, and if, that's, right. if that's the case, what can you do about it? Uh, take your egg crate and put it in the dark. Soak it in water. For a while. Well, and, and, and have some, add some bacteria and have some water and add some nutrients, but most of the algaes and things we don't want are photosynthetic. Right. So grow, grow it in the dark and get that biofilm on there first would be a thing to do. Yeah, that's what I'm doing actually with a, uh, with a new frag tank that I fired up a couple of months ago, and I've got water running through it, and I've got the egg crate that's been sitting in there for a couple of months. And, you know, so now I believe I've, um, I've got some um, you know, seasoned egg crate that hopefully will yeah. not attract algae. But, uh, yeah, right. that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, all right, another question. What um, three, two, one? The question by Noel is kind of interesting. Well, which I, in terms, go ahead. In terms of, uh, will the waste away alone effective at removing phosphates other than the skimmer? Well, the skimmer itself doesn't actually remove phosphate. The skimmer re can remove organics that phosphate are attached to. But soluble reactive phosphate, the skimmer, doesn't remove anything. And how waste away is removing phosphate and nitrate 
is through assimilation. The bacteria are eating, and I don't like that word for bacteria, but I, I understand, but it makes sense. They're incorporated and growing, and as you grow more bacteria, they're taking the phosphate and nitrate out of the water, and the skimmer removes the bacteria, thereby removing the phosphate because it's removing the bacteria cells. Gotcha. That's, that's how that works. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, what about 3 to one reefer? What's uh, Tim's thoughts about adding Fiji mud to help cycle an aquarium? Well, any type of those mud products are clay-based generally, and nitrifiers love to stick to clay. They love sticking to part positive particles. Um, the one thing you have to be careful of is that nitrifiers also need phosphate. And if you start a tank like I say, never add waste away or equal balance when you're starting a new tank, because as I said earlier, the heterotrophs can divide so much faster that they will basically steal all the phosphate and nitrate in a brand new system. Because most new systems, you're not feeding, you're maybe doing a fishless cycling. So there's not a lot of organics to degrade into phosphate and nitrate. And you can basically stall the system by a lack of, lack of phosphate in in the water. So you have to be careful adding Fiji mud or, or, or all these different devices because you're going to be adding non-nitrifying non bacteria that are going to compete for the micronutrients the nitrifiers need. It's a, a delicate balance. Sure. Especially in the be especially in the beginning, and everybody wants to be in a hurry. You know, they just, I want yeah, it cycled, I, I want it cycle fast. Yeah. If you're going to do that, and that's, that's what you want, you have to think that you don't have a fish aquarium those first 10 or 15 days. You have a bacteria aquarium. What, what's it going to do to grow the bacteria the fastest? Then you can add your fish and corals after the bacteria are established. Yeah, for my uh, peninsula tank, I started that tank about a year ago. And I, um, I started the tank with about, it's a 225-gallon peninsula tank. I started with a um, 100 pounds of live rock. I actually got a live rock that um, I put into that tank. And um, I didn't um, have any corals in that tank for five months. And I also kept the, uh, the light intensity down about 10%. On the uh, on the LEDs just to uh, let things slowly uh, age. age. Yeah, and yeah, and, uh, yeah. I did I did uh, actually get dinos in that tank um, at, at the uh, the seven month mark, but that was my fault because I just um, I threw things out of balance. I added too much food too quickly, and and uh, mm -hmm. but I just, I got rid of them with the with UV, which was good. Yeah. Um, speaking of new tanks, Boxer Buddy is uh, asking, I started a tank with dry rock and sand about 18 months ago and have had consistent cyano and hair algae issues for the whole time. Nitrate is 10, phosphate is 0 0.03. Is there any bacteria suggestion? I'd be interested to know if that was live sand. Yeah. Can you answer real quick? Are you... Boxer Buddy, if you're Bob, still you... watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is that live sand generally contains a lot of organics. And what happens when you have organics, they become, again, a reservoir of phosphates and nitrates that the cyanobacteria can kind of send uh, feelers down into, and they can extract those nutrients. And I've had customers and, and people call me, and they've put in like two inches or three inches of this live sand and just have tons of problems. And it's just, it's not per se, I'm not I mean, me knocking live sand, but you have to understand that if you have a lot of organics and it's trapped down there, it goes anaerobic, it's a perfect zone for the cyanobacteria to just persist. Uh, this is an interesting question. I, I think we might have covered it. Gould's is asking, I think I missed it. Did Tim recommend nightly dosing or is weekly fine? I think we're talking about bacteria dosing. So with the waste away gels, that's that's a daily. Um, that's a daily. And with the equal balance and the gut loading of the vitamins, what we recommend is five or six nights a week to dose a little bit. And you're not daily, dosing yeah. a ton. You're just, you're just pulsing in a couple hundred mils per, per hundred gallons. You don't need a lot to prime the system. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, we've talked about this before on this show. Clyde is asking, has anyone uh, used witch hazel for Vibrio or STN or RTN? What are, your, what are your thoughts, Tim, in terms of using witch hazel for those sorts of uh, issues? With, huh. I think uh, Paletta's done that. Done that? I, I've, I actually, I've never heard of that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I think he's a big um, witch but, hazel proponent. But how do you, 
do you just pour it in the water or you take the, the organism out and you kind of dip it in the witch hazel? How do you apply it? Because witch hazel is kind of a an antibiotic, but you apply it to your skin. Um, well, but I'm not uh, sure how you do He's going to be on next week so I can ask him. Yeah, <laughs> now, ask I'm pretty him. sure we he's talked about it. And I, from what I recall in terms of our conversations, I think that's something that um, – you know, might be more of a dip, I would, I would assume. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I'll have to go re-watch uh, that, uh, that show. <laughs> yeah, not sure. Um, what else we got going on here? Uh, Frank Aaron, so I'm downsizing my 200-gallon system by removing one display. It will be 100 after removal, but will also be taking out 40 pounds of live rock. Should I remove one rock um, a week before removing the 100 gallons? I guess the question is, should should be doing that on a gradual basis? Yeah, I definitely do every, everything in a gradual basis to a fish aquarium and reef tanks. Just uh, going in and intervening and doing something really fast generally doesn't work out very well. We got a couple of comments, one from Frank, uh, Aaron, and Algie War saying that um, you could dose to the uh, witch hazel to the display. And um, that has helped with STN. Uh, hmm. All right. Go through some more of the, uh, the comments here. Yeah, folks, if, if you want to ask some more questions and, and throw them in the chat. I see great. people are talking about, you know, the live sand and yeah. The, the, yeah. So, you, again, you have to be careful with adding live sand and, and I've had people email or call me and said, I had the live sand and I opened the bag. It stunk. I mean, it smelled like rotten eggs and I added it and everything went south. Well, I wouldn't recommend adding live sand if it smells like hydrogen sulfide because you're going to kill everything. Hydrogen sulfide is super soluble and is one of the few things that will kill nitrifiers. It's actually hard to kill outright kill most bacteria and nitrifying bacteria because nitrifiers live in a biofilm. That's why if you're, you know, chlorinating, what happens these days, people, uh, municipalities don't use chlorine, they use chloramines. The chloramine dissociates, forms ammonia in the water, and then you, you, by the time the water gets to your tap, the nitrate is so high it violates EPA guidelines. What happened? The inside of the pipe has these biofilms of nitrifiers. And what the municipalities have to start doing is adding 10, 20, 30 times more of the chloramines mm -hmm. to kill the nitrifiers that are causing the nitrate because they live in this biofilm and it's kind of a force field that's, you know, keeping it, you know, keeping the chlorine from doing its thing. So these biofilms are... They're tough. They're tough to kill, and that's where these nitrifiers are. But hydrogen sulfide, definitely, because it's so soluble, can kill nitrifying bacteria. Mm, interesting. So, I wouldn't wouldn't use live sand if you open up that bag and it stinks like rotten eggs. Throw it away or rinse it or something, and you put it in your tank, and you've now you've got all these organics and this chemistry that's just going to be very hard to to start out with. So. Be careful with that. So we got a question from uh, Noel Pant Pantoja. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Can I increase the effectiveness of liquid waste away by mixing a nightly batch with aminos and a carbon source and then drip feed it to the tank? Mm. You can, but be very careful. <laughs> I can't tell you that, how yeah. much how much to add, but definitely drip. You, you, basically, yeah, you're priming those bacteria. Um, but again, if... It depends on how much nitrate and phosphate you have in the system. If there's not a lot of food in your tank, then they're not going to do anything, which is just fine. They're going to go find it and do their thing, or they're just going to be flushed out of the system with your um, with your skimmer. Uh, Reef Girl, thanks for the, um, the, uh, the, the, the tip there for folks to hit that uh, like button if they haven't done so already so more people can find the, uh, the live stream. Um, this is a um, comment, Frank Aaron. Really glad Dr. Tim came back for round two. Great interview. So we've got some kudos there. 
Um, my pleasure. Bert uh, Minshew, does Dr. Tim think my huge SPS colonies are eating all of my nitrate, or is it the three-inch sand bed? Plenty of fish, no refugium, very small amount of live rock. Um, probably a combination of, well, both, but I'd say probably the sand bed because the, the corals would need bacteria and um, I'd have to know more about the system. But sand beds can be real uh, consumers of nutrients. Yeah, and I've yeah. always um, had kind of shallow sand beds, like maybe uh, an inch, maybe two inches. But typically the stuff just kind of gets moved around. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess when you're getting greater than three inches, then that's considered more of a deep sand bed these days. And I am not a fan of deep sand beds. Yeah, me too. You might as you might as well just put a ticking time bomb in your <laughs> tank, and it's going to go off. Yeah, it just uh, is going to go off. There's no doubt about that, it. That was and when it. <laughs> go yeah, ahead. I was going to say that's that was probably a big reason for the old tank syndrome is having a deep sand bed, right? Yeah, the deep sand beds are um, they're a mess because what happens is they go anoxic and. There is no reason that you want to promote anoxic zones in your reef aquarium. And the reason being is anoxic means no oxygen, not low oxygen, no oxygen. And all that can be produced in those systems when you have the nutrients is the bacteria are going to take sulfate and seawater is full of sulfate and they're going to produce hydrogen sulfide. And the hydrogen sulfide will build up and eventually your tank will burp or now and this this happens in nature and I'll explain it or you stir it up and release high, all that hydrogen sulfide and it kills everything and actually there is this area in Africa that has this lake and every once in a while through history the people that were surrounding the lake or that lived around the lake would all die oh. and what happened is that this lake, the topography was such that the hydrogen sulfide would build up in the bottom to a certain point, and then it would burp. And hydrogen sulfide's heavier than air, so the hydrogen sulfide would go out along wow. the land. You can look this up, and it, everybody would suffocate because you, you, you will die in a bunch of hydrogen sulfide. The fix was very simple. They put a straw in the lake. They put a pipe down, Fancy. and when the bubble, and when the bubble, it's a vent. When the bubble gets too big, it vents. And solve the problem. Wow. So, that's uh, bizarre. But hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. You don't want to promote that. And anoxic zones are all that can be produced. And it's the same, you know, bacteria that are doing you a favor by getting rid of organics when there's oxygen are producing hydrogen sulfide when it, your system's oxygen free. And it can happen in these microzones, and that's what happens in your deep sand bed and basically pretty much kills everything. Can you um, – I never reused a sand bed, you know. So when I moved a reef tank, I never, you know, moved the sand bed in the old reef tank to the new reef tank. Or it was the same tank, but it moved to a different location. I just threw out the old and put a new sand bed in. And is that always the best uh, way to approach that? Or can you clean that old sand bed somehow? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't keep it because yeah. you can't clean it. There's stuff bound to it. Yeah. There's organics. Now you've stirred up those organics that were trapped in there uh, uh, exposed them to fresh, you know, oxygen in the tank, and it's going to get a bloom and just make a mess. Sand's cheap. Yeah, I yeah, I totally agree. I've uh, I've never uh, attempted to save a sand bed. Um, yeah. Question here from Wilson Miranda. I'm going to start my 360 gallon tank. If that was your tank, how would you do it? Would what would be a good strategy? Dry sand or ocean direct sand? What bacteria should I add? How long should I wait? A lot of questions in that uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I would not use ocean sand because uh, most ocean areas are polluted, um, realistically. You know, there's just stuff in there, organisms in there you don't want. Uh, I w and I don't, like fine, I don't like fine sand, super fine, you know, the sugar crystal sand. I don't like. I like a little thicker because organisms can crawl in and you can clean it easier. And like you said, I don't go more than an inch or two, two inches, inch and a half max. But I would set it up with the crumble coral 
uh, nice rock landscaping. If you can get some uh, aged rock, mix it in with the dry rock. And then, uh, of course, using our one and only live nitrifying bacteria. That's definitely, I mean, it, it works no matter what people want to say in terms of, uh, it, I mean, it's nitrifiers from the aquarium and it works. It's our dosing with ammonia. Promote those bacteria for the first 15 days. And then you have to let it age. It depends on the organisms you want to keep. You can't keep every fish and you can't keep every coral in that brand yeah. new water. They're just not going to make it. Yeah. So um, you, you need to have patience. It's, it's a good six to eight months to have a tank really rocking where you can just tell everything. The water's shiny. The, the corals are colorful. You know, just have patience. And, and unfortunately, you're going to go through that diatom phase. Haven't fixed that one you're, yet. You're going to go through something. That's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. All right, yeah. Tim, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up. Any uh, any final thoughts f from you there before we uh, sign off? Uh, basically, patience and don't believe 90% of what you read about microbiology and bacteria on the forums because the people talking about it do not know what they're talking about. I'm sorry. That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> patience and uh, don't believe everything on the Internet. Yeah. Well, yeah. listen, uh, this, this was awesome. I'd love to have you come back. And, and um, man, we made it without a power outage. Yeah, we did. It's very yeah, nice. It's, no, it's fun. I like talking reefs and talking, you know, applied science. That's what I am. You know, it's, it's, you take these concepts and how can we apply them and have reef tanks? I've, if I could take my camera around, I have my first tank when I was six years old in the lobby. It's got the slate bottom and everything. Oh, wow. I'll show you one day. Yeah, yeah. That... You know, I've been doing this all my life. I just grew up with fish, and uh, we make it too complex. We make it too complicated. We just need to understand a few things and think about what nature does and and go slow. And there are limits to what we can have in terms of the number of fish in the feed and things like that. Pa so. Patience is a big part of it. Yep. But, it is. Um, so I wanted to end, uh, I, I hate to end the show on a, on a sad note, and, and I know uh, folks were talking about this at the beginning in, in the chat, but um, a former guest on the show, Matt Ferroni, who was the uh, husbandry director and the GM at TSM Aquatics, passed away, unfortunately, unexpectedly on uh, Tuesday. Wow. And, you know, so condolences to his family. There was actually a link to a GoFundMe page on the TSM Aquatics website. So if you want to donate some money to help out the family, then please do so. But again, our condolences to the family of Maffaroni. What a bummer. So that, go ahead. Oh. Oh, no. Okay. I'm sorry. No. All right, folks. Yeah. Well, listen, thank yeah. you uh, all for tuning in. I want to thank uh, the sponsors again, Folk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for supporting the show and, and for you folks uh, out there tuning in and contributing to the uh, to the show via the chat thank you very very much and also want to remind you that all episodes of wrapping with reef bomb are now available as podcasts on spotify apple Podcasts, google podcasts and stitcher and as i mentioned uh, a little while ago my next guest next week uh, will be um mike paletta and that's going to be on thursday november 18th at 7 p.m eastern standard time so until then be safe out there, and we will see you next time.